Welcome guys and ladies, uh, nice to see you all. This is quite an unusual event uh, for, for both Rusos and myself. About, uh, just for a little background, about a year and a half ago at the SME in uh, Denver, uh, I met up with Rusos. I've known him for quite a few years. He used to live in Brisbane, which is where I, I come from as well. And uh, we met up and we've both got a, a passion for uh, helping the industry sort of in this strategic planning and, and uh, area. And uh, we thought we'd, we'd uh, combine the sort of the university side that uh, Rusos has been developing and enhancing uh, with some of the areas of, uh, I've come more from a, uh, uh, the consulting, uh, cut of grade optimizing, schedule op optimization, uh, with mainly with large, uh, large mining companies like uh, Rio Tinto, BHP, Anglo, America. Uh, so this is a bit of a combination workshop. Um, today is uh, more of a day about uh, uh, optimization uh, as, as it's applied in the mining industry. I've, I've noticed this seems to be a field that's not really well uh, advertised, uh, really not well um, presented to the students that come out of university. Uh, so I sort of, it's a, it's a field that I'm I, I believe in, I believe it's really good for the, the industry, I believe it's actually really good for the world. Uh, this mining industry that we're involved in, it's one of the primary industries. Uh, probably you guys in, in mining, are, you have to say this less to than some others, but you know, if you don't grow it, you mine it. Uh, it's really a fundamental part of uh, the, the planet that we live on, and uh, I think it's a really healthy area to, and field to work in. And uh, what I've noticed is that when people are sort of are extracting the resources, they don't necessarily look at uh, uh, how to best make the most use of the uh, resources that we have. And uh, I will often go to mine sites that have not used our, our services before, and there's a, they don't actually do a, a life of mine plan of the whole project. Uh, most of the, the projects I work on are quite long life projects. So, uh, you know, a 10-year mine life would be quite small. So most of them are sort of 20, 30, 50, 150 years. And it's quite common that even in those mines that are well over 10 years mine life that, you know, like if sometimes I'll have a 20-year mine life and that's it. Uh, that, that's the only planning that they've done. Uh, in terms of optimization, there's, there's a whole world of optimization options that people are able to do. And they've often only optimized uh, the ultimate pit limits. And really the ultimate pit limits come in like 30, 50 years when the discounting is, you know, just about doesn't matter. And, uh, and so whereas the first five, 10 years, this is when the scheduling uh, has got a big impact uh, in, in the discounting uh, for the net present value. So, so this is the field that, that I've focused on, on the scheduling the next few years, but actually right through to the end of the mine life. Really what I'd like to do is I'd like to cement these topics. Like I, I believe these topics are actually really valuable for, for the mining industry you know, and, and, and uh, you know, for, for you individually, for the, the mines that you work with, for the people that are impacted by the mining industry. Like this to, I think this is a really valuable area that um, we, we want to really understand it. You know, we don't, we don't want a superficial understanding of this. And there, there is a lot of that in the, in, in the mining industry. Uh, it's probably the case in the world, but um, in, in all sorts of industries where, where people sort of, they just have a shallow understanding of how things work and, and that's enough. You know, someone's got a title, strategic planning engineer, but they've never done, uh, you know, a, a cut of grade study or they've never done really any uh, optimization but they're and yet they're they've got the title and uh, after you know a couple of years of moving up from senior to principal to chief or something you know they still ha really haven't learned how to how to do this optimization field and so uh, and and kind of not that they are dumb people or anything it's just that they they haven't really been exposed to uh, people that can teach about this we haven't had optimization tools that they can do the sort of analysis that we can do now. That the universities often are not familiar with these kind of things, even though actually they've been around for, uh, you know, for 20 years, for 50 years, depending on 
what you're talking about. So, do you remember, uh, did you know where that project was over at Bingham Canyon? So we were involved in Bingham Canyon uh, for uh, quite a few years before the slide happened. You know, sometimes there's just kind of unexpected things happen. And the question is, like, how are you going to deal with that? Like, that wasn't in the plan. Uh, a, a few weeks before uh, this event, I remember starting to get some phone calls. Oh, you know, how do you do this again? Um, you know, like looking for options because they could sort of see that something like this was going to happen and uh, wanting to make sure how they're going to prepare for it. Some of it is kind of physical or practical like that. Um, this is another, this is a slide though of another mining company. I took out their names, but uh, you can see at the top is the gold price. You can see the, the bottom is the, uh, the share price. So, you know, it's not just big practical events that, that uh, caused us to lose value uh, or lose the, the, share, the share value. Um, there must be decisions that are happening as well. Okay, um, so what it seems to me, I, I just kind of took this picture, I think it's from the Chicago, uh, a place in Chicago, but sometimes it seems like when you're at a mine site, it's like, where do you go? You know, like, yeah, just go straight ahead, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but basically uh, it's a mess, it's a maze, it's, a, it's confusing to know where to go, what to do. So I'm going to start today looking at kind of some of these big picture issues. And once we have a, uh, a plan for the big picture, then you can sort of go down the, uh, some of the shorter term uh, scales and it sort of makes a lot more sense. You've got some uh, parameters to, to guide you. <coughs> this is, a, I, this is a, one of those kind of slides that you see or pictures that you see posted on the, on the crib room walls or the lunch room walls. Uh, you know, the, the, the mission to do this, you might have one of them at each, each corner of the, uh, of the uh, lunch room. So like, we'll have some sort of financial goal to produce uh, superior share price performance relative to our peers. Um, to, to be recognized as a industry preferred employer and minor of choice. Um, has, has anyone come across those words? This isn't actually an Australian company that I'm talking about here, although yeah, you, you can probably uh, relate to them. Yeah, to, to, to produce so many ounces, this was actually a gold, a gold uh, company. Um, uh, produce so many ounces to keep production between uh, some sort of cost of production below the, the first quartile or the second quartile or something like that, you know, whatever quartile you're in, it's like keep the cost a little bit lower than that, you know. Another company, if it's in the top quartile, it's just to get down to the, the third quartile. Someone who's in the second quartile, get down to the halfway point. So, yeah, keep, keep costs down. Uh, don't, don't harm yourself, your people, the communities around you. And the, the thing about this is that what... Uh, The, you might be a mining engineer and you sort of say, well, look, I, I can't really relate to financial and reputation. That's more of a human resource uh, thing. But uh, I can, well, I, I can make sure I don't kill people in my, my field and, and, and don't damage the environment, clean up spills and the, these sort of things. But what I can really do is I can make sure that my cost per, per ounce uh, is, is low. So you, you might focus on one particular one of those goals and you just kind of ignore the others. If you're a geologist, you might look at, let's, let's see the resource. Let's how, how can we find some more resource? Have we got, how, how many geologists do we have here? It's okay, nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> Coming from a mining engineer. How, how many non-mining engineers are there? Like metallurgists, accountants, anyone else, no? So is every, everyone else a mining engineer? Awesome, okay. Well, this is, um, so, you know, just to guide my conversation, it's not really, um, uh, this field that we're talking about is not a mining engineer's domain. It's, there's, there's some really great geologists, there's some great processing, mineral processing people that are some of the leaders in this field. You know, the, the, the person who really understood this field the best uh, that I worked with was a guy in Rio Tinto that was a geologist. So there's certainly, 
it's not a mining engineer's domain. Uh, it's a domain where you need to spread across every field of mining. So when I say mining in the general term, so it's, it, it is the geology. Everything starts with geology. You, you miss out on that, you miss out. Everything down the road gets messed up. Then there's the mining, the processing. You know, like, so anyone can actually take over this. N nobody has been trained at university in all of the fields. And so really somebody has to pick up the, the ball and say, right, we're, uh, we're going to look at all the fields and how they all work together. And that, that's, a, that's something that's, missed, that's been missed in the, the education system of mining engineers, processing engineers. You'd think accountants and things that they would, that they would have this. And they, they do have a good sort of overview of the finances of every, every group. So that is, they are one person that puts all the pieces together. You know all the costs, all the you know recoveries that they that is a, a great sort of part, but they often don't really have the understanding of how the mine works and the flexibility in the mine, and so so having someone with a mining background is actually a really great uh, background to to come to this field. So um, okay, so so people go and pick the one that they are most can, they can relate to and they forget about the others. But what you've got is that these ones, they, they often conflict with each other. And, and this is where the problem lies with lots of objectives, is that they all conflict with each other. Sometimes they're in, in alignment, which is wonderful. But when they're not, which one do you pick? You know, for example, uh, being a, recognized as the, the industry pr preferred employer. Now, it's possible that everybody could have uh, um, you know, double your pay rate. Um, you should all have hot meals when you, you know, have lunch. Uh, not work too long. So make sure you get those seats that, you know, got a good swivel uh, and, and, a, and a window office. You know, apparently that's that. You know, like you could go and build all these little buildings and make sure they're nicely grass so that people have a really nice work environment. And okay, we, we won't actually make any money. And our, our, uh, um, we might not actually make any money, uh, which will conflict with the first option there. So let, let, let me continue with this. That we have lots of objectives here, and you'll, you'll find a lot of them actually conflict with each other. Um, even something as like safety, you know, like if you took out people from all the operations, it would be a safer in environment to work on. But again, they, they often conflict with money, they conflict with the cost per tonne. Uh, so so this is the problem. So let me show you some, uh, some objectives. See if you can relate to any of these. Who, who can see an objective that, at a mine site that they've seen up there? This, this Friday is the one that people often ask. Friday? What's that mean? This is what, like, I don't care what you do. You have to have it ready by Friday. I, I don't care what the result is. It needs to be done by you know, by the end of the month or something like that. So, so that's that's what this is a this is about. And so you have all these things. Uh, sure, you have you have things like um, increasing the reserves. Um, yeah, I'll probably come over here. So y you have things like uh, uh, increasing the recovery. If you're a metallurgist, you've got uh, uh, increasing the cash flow. We've got reducing the cost somewhere there. Right? Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Reduce the cost. Has anyone experienced that at all? <laughs> okay. Um, one or two or every one of us. Um, okay. So the thing is that each of these conflict. And when you have a conflicting objective, the danger is that if someone really pushes that, then you end up with... Um, uh, results that are aligned with that objective. And if your objective actually sh is shooting yourself in the foot, uh, you know, or shooting the, the shareholders in the foot, then, then th this, is, uh, this is what we're trying to avoid. So wouldn't it be nice if somehow we could just have one objective? So fir firstly, do you guys see that, like, do you see multiple of these in your work environment, or do you have a very clear single one. So those, those with multiple objectives, you know, get multiple. Okay, so 
I think that's everyone. Okay. So uh, that's what I find as well when I go to the mining operations. So it would be nice if all of these somehow could be condensed into one single objective. And really that's what the shareholder value is here. The, the payback period, yep, it would be, be nice to, uh, to reduce the payback period. But if it doesn't actually add value to your shareholders, uh, not really that interested. Uh, the cash flow, yep, that's a, that's a great one to increase the cash flow. But sometimes you, you need to buy equipment. And uh, like at the start of a, mine, a mining operation, if you want to maximize the cash flow um, in the current, so cash flow is just kind of this year. It's not like every, every year's cash flow. If you just looked at this year's cash flow uh, or the next couple of years' cash flow, it would be a great big negative number. So the way to maximize that would be just not to start the operation. So hardly any of the projects would be up and running if you, if you actually followed that. So really what we're wanting to do is to increase the shareholder value. That this is one overarching method uh, to, this is one overarching objective that we can use that covers all the other little ones. So last night I, I thought I'd have a look at three, three different uh, annual reports. Uh, so I just selected these three from, uh, uh, as three of the bigger mining companies. So one was Anglo. Uh, and I had a look in there and I found something that said, oh, there we go. Um, you get the next two as well. Okay, so our strategy is to, uh, and then they, they list a whole bunch of things, from which we will deliver leading shareholder returns. So at the heart of Anglo's strategy, that they're doing all sorts of things to, to increase shareholder returns. And really the word I'm wanting to, to sh for you to identify here is shareholder. So if I, I looked at the current BHP report, which has just come out in October. So in line with their purpose of creating long-term shareholder value, we do this, do that, do that, do that. So again, a, a, lot, of, a lot of things they're doing, but they're looking for long-term shareholder value. And then the final one, Rio Tinto, They, you know, these annual reports have a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of statements, and I can understand why it gets kind of confusing. But, you know, for, for people working in the mines, and for people managing, and for shareholders, and all sorts of people, but they say that their goal is to de deliver superior value for our shareholders throughout the cycle. And to do this, they use to focus on the four P's, and, and you know, so and so. But the the goal is to deliver long-term shareholder value. So I think most of us are fairly comfortable at the stage of shareholder value. And one of the things that, as someone who works in the optimization field, one of the things you really want to do is get the objective nailed right from the start. If you look at shareholder value, I think that we, we can all, um, we can get pretty good agreement straight up that shareholder value is what we're trying to maximize. Uh, it's the next step is, so what is, how do we measure that? How do we measure shareholder value? Is it, the, is it the share price? Is it the, you know, what's the best metric? You know, we had, is it the cash flow or the payback period or the discounted rate of return? Or, you know, you've got all these different, they're called financial instruments. Which financial instrument should we use? Okay, I was reading this book a few years ago and it was kind of fortunate for me because I had uh, invested a lot of time into optimization based on Ken Lane's work. So Ken Lane had written a book, I ha actually have a couple of these here, um, called The Economic Definition of All. So I had, I had I s it's like I stand on his shoulders. Like this guy did a really great uh, piece of work for the industry and it's well known uh, in the industry in the field of cutoff grade. Well, I've stood on his shoulders, built on what he's done, and uh, gone down that path. And he's maximizing net present value. So that's what I was doing. But I was wanting to understand the mining problem from the financial analyst point of view. So I asked a financial analyst mate of mine, uh, I was working at Rio Tinto at the time, and uh, 
he told me there's this, this book here called Principles of Corporate Finance. And apparently for financial analysts, this is one of the common books. It's like a, a common reference across the industry. It's updated every year. MBAs use it, economics, you know, uh, commerce and economics type uh, students use it all the time. So has anyone come across that book? No? Okay. As, as mining engineers, we don't come across it. But I, I, was, I was reading this. It's a big, thick book. It's, um, and uh, what I noticed in there is that they have two methods to work out the shareholder value. So a really good proxy for the shareholder value is the share price. And, uh, and so what they do is one method is to get the sum of the dividends and, uh, and look at the dividends and that they're expecting for the rest of time and discount them back to today. And if that's $10 and the, the shares are currently selling for $12, um, well, then you'd sell anything that you had. And if it was currently selling for $8, then you'd buy whatever you, know, you, you thought you had the money for. So this is one method that they say. And then the second method they, they talk about is getting the net present value divided by the number of shares. So this isn't just the mining industry we're talking about here. This is food, agriculture, clothing, uh, pharmaceutical, you know, medical, uh, mining, fishing. Like this, this is a generic, you know, whatever companies are on the stock market, this is a financial book for those companies. So across the board, if you can calculate the net present value of all the assets, you know, or, or all the liabilities, or, all the costs, or the, all the revenues, put them together into a net present value, divide by the number of shares, comes up with $10, and they're selling for eight, well then you buy a bunch, they're selling for 12, you, you sell a bunch. So this, I thought was really interesting. Because in the mining industry, um, particularly if you've got just a single mine, uh, it's actually quite easy to calculate the net present value. So you, you, you look at over time, you work out your costs, your revenues, discount them back. Yeah, it's obviously some assumptions that you need to, to get a net present value, but, but then you can work this out kind of quite easily. If you have a bigger company like a Rio Tinto or a Anglo, something with lots of commodities, lots of, lots of mines and things like that, it's much harder. And some analysts actually, they just focus on Rio Tinto or they just focus on, on Anglo or you know, just focus on BHP or one part of BHP, just the copper part or something like that. So there's, there's more that goes into this for bigger companies. But fundamentally, net present value is a great proxy for shareholder value. In fact, they had a chapter in this book it says, why net present value leads to better investment decisions than any other criteria. Net present value is not just like, well, I like net present value. Oh, they like discounted rate of return. Oh, that's actually just how much money can we make this year or it's, you know, we need to reduce the costs or something like that. Net present value actually stands head and shoulders above uh, the other financial instruments. So there's a lot of confusion in the mining industry about this. In fact, the last conference that I went to with Rusos and uh, in Perth, and there was a little panel at the end, and uh, I was on the panel and Jeff Whittle was there, and I, I'm not sure there's a couple of other good people there, but this was one of the questions, you know, was about uh, what's, the, what's the right, what's the best criteria to use for, uh, for mine planning? And because, of, because it, you know, at a, f for a group of mining engineers and, uh, and you know, well, not just mining engineers, mining professionals who are interested in the mine planning and optimization field, so we kind of narrowed it down. This is the group of people that we're talking about. For there to be such confusion about it is, is a problem, I think, for the mining industry. And this is why I focus initially on the objective more than I do anything else. Because if you don't agree with the objective, then everything else unravels from that. And you know, I have lots of examples as to why, for example, net present value is better than minimizing costs. 
yeah, or it's better than rate of return or better than something else. And you, there's always flaws in those other uh, metrics or uh, instruments. But with net present value, if you, if you find a way to double the net present value, well, that's exactly what the shareholders want you to do. There, there is a question about, well, should it be shareholders? Should it be stakeholders? Should it be employees? You know, are you trying to make money for the employees or are you trying to make money for the shareholders? So there is that question. Um, and uh, if, if you're interested, I can, I can talk a little on that. But, uh, but if I just try to summarize that quickly for you. The, um, if I'm at a mine site, I'm being paid by somebody to do a job. I, I believe that all of us actually have got a, uh, a sense that you should treat other people like you'd like to be treated. Do things that are in their best in interests. So when someone pays me to do a job, uh, how would I like to be treated? If I was the, the owner of the project, I'd like, to be, I'd like for them to do the job <laughs> that I asked them to do. I'd like them to do it with their best ability. And I generally find the, the engineers that I work with, and um, uh, uh, they, they want to do a good job. They, they want to do what's right and good and, and fair and appropriate. They don't normally want to just waste money and destroy the resource and yeah, just get something for, for themselves and things like that. They, I've, I've, I really like the mining industry. It's one of the reasons I really enjoy working in the industry, that there's a lot of really great people. But, but fundamentally, I guess, you know, why the shareholders? They're the ones paying the bill. You know, they're, they're the ones that risk their money to go and invest in that project and, and get it up and, and running and, and have all, all of us uh, working, working with them. And I think there's a, something that we all kind of realise is that we'd like to be uh, treated fairly. Uh, that's how we'd like to be treated. That's how we'd like to treat other people. So I think you can go back further than net present value as to why you do that. Um, you still need to work with the stakeholders, uh, the other stakeholders, for example, employees, uh, contractors, any contractors here? Yeah, we still want to work well with them. Um, but they, they can often become either a cost or a constraint. So a cost in the sense that uh, we need to pay employees well. Uh, and actually, if we don't pay them well, then they'll probably leave. And, and then we'll have this period of, uh, we've got no one to do the work, you know, you actually lose shareholder value because you've got no one doing the job properly because they've just left. Uh, so it actually ends up trickling back onto, I into the net present value and the value for shareholders. So you need to pay your, sh your employees well, you need to pay contractors well, um, otherwise there'll be a downstream effect on the shareholders. But you don't want to pay them so much that you destroy the shareholder value. Um, so you want to do things that are fair, that are, that, that are good, but um, yeah. I kind of, I, I did the book uh, as, a, as a background reference for you. It's, it's not really, I know some people write PowerPoint slides and basically give you the PowerPoint slides and I think Rusos does more of this and you, you write out notes on them. I figure if I'm going to be here, uh, I'd rather you listen to what I said uh, but uh, that's kind of how I've designed it. But the next section was going to be about uh, some integrated optimization. Okay, so in the mining industry, we have all these different kind of areas. So if you're a mining engineer, you might be involved in, in pushback design and, and uh, scheduling of that, maybe even cut of grades. So the, these ones here, the mining engineers, have a greater focus on. It's probably why I've got three points instead of one. You know, like the geologist, you know, creating resource models. You know, I've just got one point there. Actually, if you go into that, there's the world opens up uh, quite a lot again. Likewise, processing would probably be disappointed that I only mention processing as a one one dot point. Um, okay. So there's all these different areas, and in the in the real world, the, all of these are actually related. So th the real complexity of the problem is that all of these are interrelated. 
so people often don't realize that. They, they just kind of think that, well, it's in the ground, you, you create a resource model, you develop some pushbacks. Once you've got those, you create a sequence of, for, you know, a sequence of mining, you apply some color grades and you process it. So people see that they're related like this. But what they often miss is that they also, you can start really anywhere and go backwards as well. So if I take it to the extreme, if you look at the financial information, if you change the prices, you change the costs, uh, then that can change the, um, in the resource, what's economic to mine. So you might go from a little, um, little underground, take out the high grade, into a massive surface project. And when you do that, all of your uh, Krieging parameters, your SMUs, your selective mining units, they, they all change, and so you get, um, I'd, I'd appreciate a nod, Rusos, or shake the head if I'm saying the wrong thing here. But uh, these, these parameters change, so they impact the, um, the uh, so, so the, the price and the, the size of the mining that we do can, in, can influence our resource estimate, can obviously in influence our, our pushback. So you have a you know, higher price, you'll end up maybe taking out a bit more ore, a bit bigger pits, a bit deeper undergrounds, a bit Bit, uh, bit lower grade material that's, so, you know, and, and then you change these and ev everything else changes. Uh, you get some new processing technology and suddenly there's, there's resources that you didn't even consider before. Maybe you didn't know how to treat oxide before and now you can and so you add some processing technology and, and, and certainly from here on at least, uh, they all change. So there's this interaction between them all. Ideally, you would optimize all of those together. You know, that, so that nothing's falling between the cracks. Typically what happens is each one of these, there's so much complexity in each one of them that they're just analyzed independently. And so there's an opportunity for things to fall between the cracks. So resources, you know, we just give those to Joel, just you know, don't really care what happens there, just give us a block model. And uh, sometimes you get this little voice saying, ah, which block model would you like? Like I've got a hundred of them, I've got a thousand of them. Um, uh, just one would be good, thank you. Um, you know, like there's a, you control what happens, but actually there's more to it. And I think we're going to learn more about that over the next couple of days. But the same thing happens, like if most of us are mining engineers here, same thing happens with processing. You ask the processing person, what's the processing capacity? They say, oh, well, it's, it's uh, they'll start this big long spiel. Well, it's, it, you know, the feasibility, we had 20, 20 million tons, and then we upgraded the, the widget, and, you know, we, we're doing 25, but in the ores that have, you know, and, and you're just hearing yada, 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 20, yada, yada, up, up, now it's 25, yada, 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 yada. Okay, tw so it's 25. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's 25. That's what we can do then. So the mining engineer goes away and gives a 25 million ton, ton, ton a year uh, plan. And so, okay, well, processing guys, now this is what we can do with the 25 million ton plant. Whereas actually there's a lot of opportunities for the processing engineer to adapt. And they, they, they probably could have done 26 or 27. And if you had have only given them 24 or 23, they would have got a little bit better recoveries. But you know, they're doing all these trade-offs. And so we often, as mining engineers, miss that. So, you know, this is a, today is about sort of just recognizing that there's a bigger puzzle to solve. And when we solve that, we, you know, we need to talk to mining engineers, uh, uh, sorry, we need to talk to processing engineers. We need to talk to, you know, marketing people. It's, is anyone in a commodity that needs to be marketed? You know, like copper and gold, not so much, but, you know, iron ore, coal, um, what, mineral sands, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, marketing has a huge role there. And, uh, you know, the, the downstream people that use them in the smelters and things like, what's actually the final customer's constraints? Are we, you know, sometimes marketing can say, okay, this is the band of, um, uh, this is the schedule that we have to produce. 
So we do that. But it's a, at a huge cost to the mine, and it's a little benefit to the, to the ultimate smelter. Sometimes I've been in processes where, um, in, uh, in alumina, where uh, we have uh, produced a consistent feed, but actually the smelt of alumina and silica, but actually silica is like waste. It's like a cost. And so we have given them consistent costs, whereas what they would prefer from a net present value point of view is give me the low silica stuff first, and if that means later I have to have high silica and incur more costs later, I'd rather actually have it that way. I have to build more capacity later, but compared to um, what I'm asking for. Uh, so, so yeah, I, this is another big field. So if we're going to analyze all of this together, we're going to make some simplifications. You know, we, we can't model this in as much detail as the, there actually is in the, geology, in, in the resource area. We can't look at the full uh, complexity of processing. So we, we actually cut our problem down and uh, you know, there is a danger that we'll cut it down so far and model something that's not really even realistic anymore. So you don't want to go that far but you do need to cut it down a bit. And, and that's, that's what we typically do when we do our planning. We, like, yeah. So like we, uh, we will typically in, in scheduling, um, we'll, we'll consider all of these uh, coarsely or crudely, or roughly. Um, we often don't get so involved in here. Um, but the more of these things that you can do together, the better results you'll end up with. Like sometimes you'll, it, it'll be better than, for example, just looking at processing by itself or just looking at you know, phase design by itself without any of these things. I'll just show you this last, last slide and then we'll uh, he head for a little break. So I'm going to have a little example of, uh, of the complexity of the mining problem. So we've got 10 little blocks here. Uh, each block has got a cutoff grade distribution. And just to show you how complex just this little bit of sequencing is, or sequencing and cutoff grade, if you're trying to figure out what the best cutoff grade is, there'll be, there's, uh, it, if there's 62 different options here of cutoff grades in 10 blocks, this is how many options there are. It's about 10 to the 17. It's just massive. And so we can never actually go through all of those options. So you need algorithms that can still get you to the best result without actually going through the full problem. But as a you know, concept, just to think about, well, this is just the scheduling or, or the cutoff grade complexity. If you add to that processing complexity or phase design complexity or marketing complexity, it can just blow out to just crazy numbers. You know, the number of electrons in the universe or something is it's small compared to these numbers. You know, the, the distance between the, the limits of the galaxy <laughs> in millimeters, small compared to, well not, not this number, but compared to the problems that we're dealing with, we actually do have very complex problems. And there's some great algorithms out there, uh, and we're going to look at some of that this afternoon. But, so after, after morning tea, we'll go, through, we'll go through a little bit of theory on, uh, on optimization uh, in, from the cutoff grade world. And then in the afternoon, we'll put that into practice.